All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Nason. I'm the senior Iran analyst at the International Crisis Group. Happy to have you joining us for this Twitter space experiment um, marking the launch of a new crisis group briefing. Um, very pleased to have uh, with us uh, Dr. Ali Baez, who's the Iran project director and senior advisor to the president at Crisis Group, and uh, Eli Maya, who is a senior policy fellow and deputy head of the Middle East and North Africa program at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Um, so the context um, for why we're having this uh, discussion will be, I think, familiar to most people who've taken the time to uh, join us. Um, negotiations between the U.S., Iran, and other parties to the uh, nuclear agreements and some parties that are not formally part of the nuclear uh, agreement but have very much been engaged in the process have um, swung repeatedly from conclusion to collapse uh, to near conclusion again and apparently now back in the direction of collapse. Uh, so Ali, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, the report title is is restoring the Iran nuclear deal uh, still possible? Um, and there's a question mark at the end of it. So uh, is it? And uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's, uh, what's in the report? Thank you, Nason. And I would also like to start by thanking Ellie for joining us today. Um, that we've now been in the process of uh, negotiations to restore the Iran nuclear deal, JCPOA, for a year and a half. Um, I want to remind everyone on this call that it took the same amount of time to negotiate the original agreement between the conclusion of the interim deal in Geneva in November of 2013 to the conclusion of the JCPOA in July of 2015. The process is now really bordering on the absurd, as the economists uh, uh, pointed out last week. Um, our report looks back at the making of the impasse in the Vienna talks, um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. The reality is both sides committed mistakes, uh, misread how much the other side wanted or needed the deal, and miscalculated. Uh, the real question uh, is, uh, where do we go from here? Now, we've been quite cynical about the prospects uh, of a breakthrough for some time now, because fundamentally, the 25-page detailed agreement that has been sitting uh, in Vienna uh, since March and has been slightly modified in the past few weeks uh, will not mitigate the risk for the Iranian leadership that in 2025, with a potential new U.S. president, they might find themselves in the exact same position as they were in 2018 when Trump uh, withdrew from the JCPOA. Uh, with one major difference uh, in 2025, of course, uh, which is the fact that the hardliners in Tehran will have no scapegoats uh, this time around, can't put the blame on Rouhani and Zarif uh, for being naive, and plus, it will be the second time that they've been burned by the U.S. Uh, there is still a narrow pathway to an agreement, especially uh, in November after U.S. Uh, midterm elections. Um, but both sides are already implementing their plan B. Uh, every other week, the U.S. is imposing new sanctions or uh, doubling and enforcing the existing ones. Uh, Iran is installing uh, new centrifuges. And of course, the IAEA's uh, knowledge about Iran's uh, nuclear activities is shrinking by the day as well. Uh, nevertheless, neither side really wants to pull the plug on, on the talks, um, and uh, they both believe uh, that status quo of no deal, no crisis uh, is sustainable. Um, now, we, we disagree. Uh, we think that uh, uh, both sides have uh, very limited space for uh, additional escalation at this stage. Uh, Iran uh, would have to really start doing, uh, uh, taking measures uh, that would be highly provocative if it wants to get the attention of the other side, uh, like activities that fall in the rubric of weaponization, really. Uh, and for the West, uh, the dial of sanctions is already uh, maybe on 8 out of 10. Uh, and for them to be able to uh, significantly increase pressure on Iran, they would have to resort uh, to uh, measures like snapping back the UN sanctions that would be highly provocative and could result in Iran withdrawing not just from the JCPOA, but also from the NPT altogether. And the last country that did this uh, was uh, North Korea in 2003. And we all know how that story ended. Um, and of course, uh, this is just uh, the escalation that the parties control themselves. There could be escalation uh, that uh, would be external, uh, like uh, what Israel would do. Uh, we know the uh, shadow conflict between Iran and Israel, which is multidimensional, is reaching new heights and can easily uh, result in the kind of action that would uh, spiral out of control. For instance, um, we quote a, a former senior Iranian official who says, 
uh, that is certain if there is a, another uh, Israeli covert operation against uh, Iranian nuclear facilities or an assassination of an Iranian nuclear scientist, that for sure it would result in Iran enriching to 90 percent, which is not a measure that uh, the Biden administration uh, could sit on its hands and not do anything about. Um, now, if the escalation is to be avoided, uh, our report uh, suggests that uh, contingency planning would have to start now. Um, the reality is, uh, the uh, when it gets to diplomatic options, uh, there are not a lot of options that look promising. Um, you know, if you want to uh, come to the conclusion that the JCPOA's restoration is not possible, you might consider a more for more kind of agreement. The reality is that Iran has won more sanctions relief and more sustainable and effective sanctions relief, and the U.S. has wanted a longer and stronger deal. So both sides want more, and why not negotiate a more for more? Well, uh, it has taken a year and a half to negotiate a deal that they already had. So it's not very promising to think that they would be able to negotiate a broader agreement. Um, and plus, they are probably running out of time. Um, what about a less for less agreement, an interim deal? Uh, well, that was tried twice in 2021 uh, and uh, it didn't work. Uh, it's probably going to be extremely difficult uh, for both sides to find a commensurate quid pro quo. Um, and, and so that also seems quite unlikely. Uh, an even narrower option, uh, if you think of an interim agreement as a multi-measure package, uh, a, a single measure package that Iran would uh, freeze one nuclear activity and in return the U.S. would provide some sanctions relief, um, would that be possible? That too, we think, is going to be difficult to negotiate, although maybe more realistic than other options, uh, especially because it probably will fall short of uh, the congressional requirement under the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act uh, to uh, uh, basically for Congress to, to intervene and, and review uh, such agreement. Uh, and then there's the, uh, I would say, urgent humanitarian uh, agreement. Um, we know that there is a prisoner swap deal that has been negotiated and again has been sitting on the table for a while um, uh, between Iran and the U.S. Uh, that could be implemented along with some uh, unfreezing of Iranian assets for humanitarian trade, things should happen with or without uh, any of the uh, uh, nuclear-related uh, agreements that uh, I just mentioned. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, none of these look promising. So at minimum, uh, the parties should agree uh, on a s uh, set of red lines and uh, tripwires that they would not cross so that they can keep a lid on this situation and prevent it from escalating to a, to a level that could result in, uh, in a military confrontation. For Iran, that means uh, not enriching to 90 percent, uh, not undertaking activities that are related to weaponization. Um, not uh, further reducing uh, IAEA's access uh, below Iran's uh, safeguards commitments, uh, and of course not uh, uh, engaging in the kind of uh, assassination uh, that we've seen in the past few weeks uh, with plots against uh, former National Security Advisor John Bolton, uh, uh, and uh, we know that there are other plots again against other uh, former U.S. officials as well. In return, uh, we suggest that the U.S. and the West should also uh, not snap back the U.N. sanctions, uh, and also try to uh, dissuade Israel uh, from undertaking uh, the kind of covert operations uh, that could be uh, highly provocative um, and, and damaging. Uh, so again, it's not uh, a very uh, uh, promising uh, set of recommendations. It's really the minimum uh, that we're uh, putting on the table now, uh, because uh, at least it would prevent uh, a lose-lose dynamic that we're currently uh, to turn into an absolute tragedy. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Great. Great. Thanks, Ali. And, and before I turn it to, uh, to Ali, I just want to remind everyone that uh, you're welcome to DM uh, your questions. We've already got a couple. I've certainly got a couple. Um, but um, I'm happy to turn it over now to, to Ali. Um, and Ali, your, your focus obviously is, is on the European side of the equation. And, you know, when we talk about the Europeans, we're really talking about a couple of different things, aren't we? We're talking about the EU on the one hand that uh, is the facilitator of the negotiations and then the E3 who are actually you know, parties to the negotiations. And it seems as though statements over the past few days, even from the typically uh, optimistic uh, Joseph Burrell um, and then the statement yesterday from the E3, um, the, the reading between the lines, there seems to be uh, a great deal of frustration uh, to a certain degree. And just wondering what your sense is of how Brussels and the E3 capitals uh, see this, where, you know, to a certain extent, uh, 
a lot of the, the key decisions at this point don't lie necessarily with them, right? So they, they come down on the issue of sanctions relief. They come down to discussions between the U.S. and, and Iran on the IAEA front. Obviously, they were uh, they helped table the resolution in June at the Board of Governors. So I was wondering if you could unpack a little bit for us how you see the EU and the E3 to the extent that, you know, that they're the same or, or, or different in their approach um, as, you know, the, the fall leads into a, a greater state of uncertainty on this. Sure. Thank you, Nathan, and thank you to ICG for inviting me today. Um, thanks, Alijan, uh, for, for a great report from you and your team, uh, which I had the chance to review, so many congratulations. Um, I have some points uh, that come in strong agreement with the report and, and some perhaps more optimistic uh, takes about what the future might entail, but we can go into that later. Let me start by um, responding to Nathan's question about where the Europeans are at at the moment. So I think two words, deep frustration, uh, summarizes the situation pretty well. Um, you know, Joseph Borrell, who has really gone out on a limb here uh, over the summer, both in terms of pushing for that meeting in Doha between the US and Iran proximity talks that the EU was facilitating. You know, it's no small thing for the EU high representative to, to make a trip to Tehran uh, during, uh, you know, wartime in Europe with Ukraine and during a time where, Iran is increasingly unpopular uh, across different Western capitals for an array of reasons, uh, ranging not just from nuclear diplomacy, but the issue of uh, dual nationals um, that are detained in Iran, um, to just generally the increasing uh, image of Iran as a as a problematic actor on, on the nuclear issue and, and in the region. So the, the, I think the U team uh, really made a gesture of good faith by going to Tehran and trying to bring Iran back into a serious negotiating stance after the long pause um, really created, I would say, by the Ukraine conflict. And we can go in deeper uh, about what I think is quite a profound impact of Ukraine, both on, on the Western side and the Iranian side. Uh, and I think many history notes will be written about what this meant uh, for Iran's future with the West. Um, but, you know, Doha, uh, there was a real blowback to the European efforts because the U.S., I think, in particular, saw it as a wasted opportunity from the Iranian side that there were excessive demands made. And over the summer, the Europeans really tried um, to give it one last push, uh, lots of back and forth uh, between Tehran and Washington to try and get another meeting, another set of proximity talks, this time um, in Vienna with all the stakeholders of the nuclear deal at play. And I think it was really significant that we had representation from China and more importantly, I would say Russia on this nuclear file in Vienna, because it showed, I think, the seriousness um, of getting uh, an agreement to a finishing line if you have all the parties, particularly uh, probably the most influential on the political front on Iran, which in my view is Moscow and Beijing, um, to try and get Iran um, to agree on some of the more thorny issues, including what we had thought was going to be um, somewhat a resolved issue, which was this uh, issue of the access of the agency of the IAEA um, to get more information from Iran regarding um, the safeguards probe. And I think there was real optimism from the European side um, that they had gotten traction from Iran on this issue, um, particularly because the EU managed to include text in August, which really pushed the E3 to, to I think, go out of their comfort zone on this IAEA safeguards probe. Um, now, what has happened and emerged really is that my sense is the jury is still out in Tehran about whether the broader benefits of this deal um, merit Iran rolling back its nuclear advances that it has made since 2018 when the maximum pressure campaign from the Trump administration began. And, you know, I think that we, we are seeing a um, reflection of a lack of appetite in Tehran to take responsibility and accountability for getting back into this deal from any of the main uh, decision shapers or decision makers in, in the system, in the political system in Iran. But at the same time, they know the alternative of this process collapsing um, would be terrible for Tehran from political, economic, security aspects all around. So nobody uh, in Tehran wants, I think, um, at least the ones that are in the decision-making rank, nobody really wants this process to die. Uh, there are forces, I would say, that would like uh, to kill this agreement, but I don't think in the top echelon of the decision-makers were at that stage because they've been hanging on to this deal, um, you know, since Trump reneged on it. And there's still, I think, appetite to try and get a deal that's good enough for Iran 
in the in in the pocketbooks of the Rainsy administration to try and alleviate the many many different pressure points of the economy. Um, but they just don't have the consensus yet in Tehran. Now the problem for the E3, I would say, France, Germany, the UK in particular, is that they have reached the end of, I think, their diplomatic um, openness and appetite to make concessions to Tehran on, let's say, the nuclear components of the deal. And we have hit a wall, I would say, or a ceiling, let's say, with the US position on how far they are able to extend um, sanctions easing and relief up front to Iran or how far they can guarantee that this is sustainable. So we, we've reached an exhaustion point on, on the West um, that is not uh, in line with the exhaustion point in Tehran. So we're, we've been in this very, um, I think, frustrating game now for, for a few months um, where the Europeans and the Americans really want to close this set of issues. And Iran um, is still insisting on keeping issues open or trying to nudge for further um, concessions. And I think this comes back to the bottom line point that there is nothing that can guarantee that this agreement or any agreement with the U.S. administration uh, can be sustainable. Um, now, I'll, I'll just finish this question by saying that you know, I think a key question that needs to be posed um, to um, Raisi, if he does make it to New York to attend the U.N. General Assembly with his team, um, is, you know, some top line messaging from the Europeans um, and I would say um, the Arab Gulf countries that are going to be there at the highest level um, to really message some high level political decisions that Iran has to make about whether um, really allowing this process to collapse, uh, which could close the doors to going back to the JCPOA as we know it really, uh, whether that is worthwhile. Um, and, and really for me and, and, and myself and Svander about Markadi wrote a piece of several weeks ago, Iran is the party that has the most to lose from this process collapsing. Certainly everyone will share the blame and everyone will um, take a hit to their interests. But I think Iran will, will have the biggest costs imposed on it across the board, particularly the missed opportunities uh, that it faces on, on, on the economy about being able to reintegrate uh, on a political and economic front back into the international markets. Um, but um, this is going to be a decision that um, I think this, uh, folks in Tehran are going to be very hesitant to make at a time when they feel, particularly with Ukraine, and this perception that there is a multipolar world of emerging. And let's not forget the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting is coming up when Iran is expected to become full member. There is this you know, real push towards China, uh, towards Russia, towards building up what Iran's Supreme Leader has for, for you know, decades called for immunity towards Western sanctions uh, with much more, I would say, reliable partners as they view it, China and Russia now. So Nisan, I'll leave it there and look forward to um, the discussions ahead. Thanks, Dali. That's fantastic. And, and you know, in the report, we, we kind of focus in on the, the early days of March as this uh, almost hinge period that, I mean, it's a first draft of history that we're essentially doing here. But, you know, you have in the, in the final days of February and early March, um, this, I don't want to use the, mo the word momentum because it's a bit cliche, but towards the, the end of February and the first few days of, of March, we have that photo of, of uh, you know, the, the Iranian and European negotiators, you know, huddled essentially to, to discuss the issue of safeguards. Uh, the E3 negotiators leave Vienna, I think it was on the first, uh, 3rd of March, saying or, or tweeting essentially, our job is done. Um, and then Grossi going to Tehran and signing the safeguards roadmap on the 5th. And if you look at kind of historical hinge points, that's also the point where it seems to be the closest and also where it seems as well where the drift really begins. The Russians introduce more sweeping sanctions demands. <clears throat> the EU decides to put the talks on pause. There are no... Uh, and, and pulling out the, the prism a little bit more, uh, we kind of point out as well how sui generis this entire process is where you have multi-party talks with the two central protagonists with the U.S. and Iran not even speaking directly to each other um, over a deal that they've already agreed to. Uh, and after March, we get until Doha, um, no kind of in-person negotiations and even there indirect ones. And it isn't until after uh, Burrell's throw of the diplomatic dice that Ellie was talking about that um, all of the P5 plus one uh, and Iran are back in the same place at the same time. Well, five months basically passes where you have uh, no E3 US meetings with the Russians as well. So, you know, you've got 
uh, a Russian doll process of different actors engaged in all of this. But um, you mentioned the dynamics in Tehran, and I, and I want to take it over to, to Ali before we start to get into some of the, the questions. And once again, feel free to DM us. We've already got a couple of good questions coming in. But Ali, it seemed a couple of weeks ago that the Iranians were essentially getting their proverbial ducks in order for uh, selling a deal uh, more than they had at any process really since the, the negotiations started under the Rouhani administration, right? You had uh, Bagheri Khani and Sham Khani breeding the, briefing the Majlis, uh, both the National Security Committee and then the wider Majlis. Uh, you had uh, a couple of meetings within the, the Supreme National Security Council. You had Amir Abdullahian, the foreign minister, saying something along the lines of, you know, we may not get everything we want in a deal, but the other side doesn't get everything it wants in the deal. And it seemed as though um, there was a process of, of softening it, which is, again, uh, looking at it in, in a certain sense, it's very peculiar that a lot of the people that are responsible now for negotiating Iran's return to the deal are the same individuals who criticized the Rouhani administration for signing the agreement in the first place. Bagheri Khani is not uh, a known uh, advocate uh, of the agreement, um, and neither are many of the other people who've been appointed uh, under Raisi's cabinet and, and his diplomatic team, yet now they are entrusted essentially, uh, with trying to finalize uh, a negotiation that they spent a lot of time uh, in opposition to. So essentially, you know, what's happened since there, there seemed to be this effort to, to close ranks? Uh, was it an effort to close ranks? And if it is, what's basically happened since then, where Tehran is uh, moving back towards saying it's about guarantees, it's about safeguards? That's a good question, Nason, and I think it reflects the internal debate in Iran, because there are some uh, in the system, and I would put uh, the foreign ministry uh, and, and maybe uh, writ large the government in, in that category, uh, that they realize that this is as good as it gets and that the opportunity cost of not getting back JCPOA for Iran uh, completely uh, uh, you know, out, uh, outmaneuvers any potential marginal benefits that Iran would get from uh, additional uh, changes to the text. I mean, look, this 25-page agreement in the past uh, four or five months, maybe even uh, uh, at best, there are only four or five paragraphs that have been changed, uh, and again, marginally. Uh, in this period, Iran has lost tens of billions of dollars of potential additional oil revenue. Uh, and uh, for a government that is dealing with uh, daily economic troubles of the country, and I think is now disillusioned after a year in office, uh, by by the fact that it could resolve these uh, without sanctions relief, uh, it, it is essential to try to get uh, the deal restored. Uh, but there are other elements in the system who either because of the political risk, as I explained, or because they have vested economic interest uh, in the continuation of sanctions regime, uh, they have been trying to block uh, the restoration uh, of the deal. But uh, again, the fundamental issue uh, of economic guarantees that Iran has been seeking from the beginning. This is not a new issue. Uh, it was uh, one of the things that uh, Abbas Arakhchi, who was one of the original architects of the JCPOA, uh, was pursuing, and so did Bagheri Kani, who was uh, an opponent of the deal. Uh, they have been seeking economic guarantees that would outlive the Biden administration, and that is simply something that does not exist in the real world. Uh, it, there has been leaks uh, in the press about a potential wind down period. Uh, if sanctions are snapped back, that would be longer than the standard 90 to 180 day period uh, that uh, the Treasury Department usually grants. Uh, um, but, you know, the reality is, again, the next president can come in on day one and say a two and a half year wind down period that the previous administration agreed to is now going to be two and a half months. Uh, so, uh, you know, there is there is no uh, economic uh, or legal guarantee that any U.S. president can provide uh, whether these negotiations continue for another uh, 18 months or 18 years. Um, and same issue with uh, the safeguards, uh, uh, IEA safeguards issue. I understand Iran's concerns. Uh, I mean, the fact that the source of the information that was used uh, to conduct uh, the investigation on the ground was the archive, Iran's own nuclear archive that Israel took out of Iran in 2018, uh, is quite troubling for Iran. I understand that because uh, basically uh, if they prove that uh, the nuclear archive's information is accurate, then the, the broader lesson of nuclear archive, which is that Iran was indeed pursuing a nuclear weapons program pre-2003, would be validated. And that would be self-incriminating for the Iranians. And plus, uh, there are other elements in the nuclear archive that could be used uh, in the future uh, 
uh, to continuously harass uh, Iran and never allow its nuclear program uh, to become normal. Uh, that, those concerns are understandable. What is not understandable is how Iran wants this to be resolved, because in this particular case that we've had traces of nuclear material that the IEA has been able to find, uh, there is just no way that the IEA can look the other way. Uh, and there is no way of fudging this, because this really goes to the basic mandate of uh, the IAEA, its raison d'etre as, a, as an international agency, to do nuclear accountancy. Uh, and so uh, this is why uh, I think uh, there are people who uh, in Tehran who might think that with more leverage, they might be able to extract better terms, um, that maybe this uh, winter with European energy security concerns uh, uh, increasing uh, and uh, U.S. and Israel's concerns about Iran's nuclear advancements uh, increasing as well, uh, that they would be able to extract better terms. But I think there are others in the system who don't want to deal and are using these demands as pretexts uh, to, to prevent it from happening. Thanks, Ali. And, and for those of you listening, I mean, you may wonder why we're putting out this, this report right now. <clears throat> we actually started drafting this um, in the aftermath of the Doha talks, um, because these two issues that, that Ali referred to, the issue of, of guarantees and the issue of safeguards, uh, they're not new issues. They've been issues that have basically been there since day one. And, and for all of the technical um, progress that has been made on the specifics of how does Iran roll back its nuclear program? What is the sequence? Which general buckets of U.S. sanctions come off? These two issues of uh, guarantees and, and safeguards have, have been there from the beginning. And, and in, the, um, in the report, we use, we borrow Philippe Herrera's uh, photograph, the, the, the lead French negotiator, um, that says uh, on the front page of the draft, it's a, they literally put, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed on the very front page of the text in, in, uh, in January and, and, and February. And um, so, you know, part of this report that we started to put together after Doha and then hit pause briefly to see if if the, the August uh, round could yield a breakthrough was that, you know, ultimately on, on these two questions, on the issue of guarantees and on the issue of safeguards, it may well be the case that not every circle in these negotiations can be squared. Uh, and, and Ali knows that I've joked that the easiest way for Iran to, to get a guarantee of extending sanctions relief by another year is to have agreed to this text uh, a year ago. And it really hasn't fundamentally changed um, a great deal. Um, and obviously, the safeguards uh, issue is, is very much um, on the table right now. We have the, the, the Board of Governors convening today. Reports uh, from the agency have come out that, um, as they usually do, are, are two sets of reports. Essentially, the state of play in Iran's nuclear program, which is extremely uh, concerning. And, and if you look at Ali's thread today, we have uh, an updated chart showing Iran's stockpile growth uh, since uh, mid-2019, when it began to breach the JCPOA's parameters. Um, and, and by every metric, it's, it's quite concerning, whether you're looking at the levels of enrichment, the continued uh, stockpiling, um, the deployment of advanced centrifuges, essentially every day that goes past is another day where even if the negotiations are stalled, Iran's new program uh, isn't. And then the second report is, uh, is quite remarkable as well. It, the last IA report in, in May was, was 10 pages, and I, I think it really drills uh, into the heart of the, this Iranian argument about the investigation being a, a politicized one, because that, that report that the agency put out is granular in its detail of exactly the IAEA has been doing. It's taken satellite imagery, it's done underground sampling, um, and found traces of activity prior to 2003 that simply uh, require explanation because that is the IAEA's mandate in, in nuclear accountancy. Um, but, you know, again, over the past few days, the Iranians have made uh, a closing of this file uh, a precondition, and the rest of I, and, and at early stages, I think, you know, including the Russians and Chinese, even though they voted against the BOG resolution in June, uh, I think the, the P5 plus one consensus position throughout the talks has been that this does have to be addressed somehow, even if they, they disagree on um, uh, whether or not BOG is the, is the right place to actually address it through censure. Um, now, Ali, I wanted to come back to you for a second because, you know, Ali talked about the views in Europe and you've both talked about the views in, in uh, Tehran. Um, but... Uh, Talk us a little bit about how you see the view in, in, in Washington as well right now. We've got the midterms coming up um, in a few weeks. This has been uh, a, a, an issue that President Biden uh, campaigned on to a certain degree, a, a return to, to mutual compliance. Uh, but at the same time, when he was in Israel, he said the military option is on the table. He's clearly uh, you know, planning in, in both senses. And you also mentioned that essentially the U.S. has, over the past few months, given a strong 
uh, teaser of what its own uh, Plan B could look like with uh, a couple of uh, rounds of oil and petrochemical sanctions in June, July and August, um, plus a couple of other rounds of sanctions uh, in response to other uh, Iranian activities of concern in the U.S., including ballistic missile sanctions, um, uh, the, the designation uh, last week of Iran's intelligence ministry following a, an Iranian-sponsored uh, hack against the Albanian government, according to Albania, the U.S., and, and NATO. So how do you see a, a Biden administration uh, looking at this, both in terms of the, the negotiations, but also in terms of uh, its own domestic politics going into election season? Look, of course, uh, dealing with Iran is always controversial uh, in Washington, uh, and there is a political price to pay. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, my impression was that if Iran had come back to uh, respond to the draft of August 15th uh, and had said yes, uh, the president and the administration uh, were willing to pay the political price uh, in Congress, even though the debate, uh, in order related debate uh, in Congress would be pretty close uh, to, to the midterms uh, because it will happen in, in September. Um, but right now, I think there is a uh, similar degree of frustration in Washington that uh, Eddie was talking about uh, in, in Paris, London, uh, Berlin and Brussels um, and very little appetite uh, to continue um, making concessions to Iran that Iran would only pocket and would ask for more. Um, and uh, we're now too close to the midterms uh, and with uh, Democrats' uh, electoral prospects right now looking actually better than uh, what was forecasted a few months ago. Uh, they have very little appetite to have a controversial uh, Iran-related debate uh, on the Hill. Uh, which means that uh, most likely uh, the U.S. is not going to uh, show uh, any flexibility uh, in, in the coming weeks, although there might be some additional uh, rounds of back and forth between the two sides uh, through the European Union. Uh, but it's quite unlikely that we would see a breakthrough uh, until November. Uh, then, you know, the problem uh, in this process is that, again, in November, both sides thinking that they have the upper hand. Uh, they could still once again squander an opportunity uh, for a breakthrough, uh, which might very well be the last opportunity, because although I don't expect much uh, to happen in this board of governors uh, at the IAEA this week, um, uh, uh, that would go beyond the E3 statement uh, over the weekend. Uh, but there might be another resolution uh, or even a referral to the Security Council at the last uh, BART meeting uh, in December. Uh, and so... Uh, the window might uh, actually and really close uh, uh, at the end of the year. Uh, but there are, again, there is also a possibility of a breakthrough. And I think uh, the administration would be willing to pay the price uh, for it even at that point, uh, because uh, just like uh, is the case for Iran, uh, Plan B options for the U.S. also range from uh, unattractive uh, to outright ugly. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, at the same time, uh, the U.S. is uh, going to continue uh, doing the maintenance of sanctions, uh, which is uh, this uh, uh, regular uh, um, ratcheting up uh, of uh, new designations. That doesn't necessarily mean uh, they're breaking new grounds. Uh, and again, unless there is a uh, very provocative on the Iranian side, uh, I don't foresee a uh, major uh, action uh, from, from the U.S. They want to keep it steady. Uh, until uh, November. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, there is also the possibility that post-November, uh, if they lose control over the House um, uh, uh, or maybe both chambers, uh, that the Iranians, the, the opponents of an agreement in Iran would become even more vocal of saying that basically this is a lame duck administration and only has two years left in office and uh, doesn't control Congress anymore, uh, Congress that is so hostile to the JCPOA. And so there is no point in dealing uh, with the Biden administration and Iran would be better off uh, keeping its leverage intact until uh, 2025. So there are all of these uh, complex calculations that could come into play. Uh, but, uh, but, but right now, I think their preference uh, is to uh, continue the status quo of uh, no deal, no crisis. Thanks, Ali. And just a reminder to everyone, you're welcome to DM us your questions. Um, the theme of a couple of which, and, and Eli, I'll, I'll throw this over to you and, and then uh, to Ali for, for his thoughts as well. Um, a couple of the questions have to do with um, Russia and, and China, um, in particular, uh, the Russian role. And uh, fundamentally, um, not to oversimplify it, um, and, but, but to paraphrase a couple of questions that have come in, uh, 
Uh, is Moscow a help or hindrance to concluding this deal? Well, Nissan, I think like most state actors, uh, Russia does what is in its own interests, and that's had a uh, habit of fluctuating over time. Um, you know, we've seen from leaks of audio tapes from former foreign minister Zarif, his take of uh, whether Moscow was helpful or not during different parts of both the negotiations of the JCPOA and the implementation phase. And his reflections of that period was that actually, um, you know, there were real moments where Russia was putting a spanner in the works. Um, and it, you know, it, what had became clear during that March hiatus for the talks was that even, you know, the Raisi government, uh, which has probably had the most pro-Russian leanings, um, was facing difficult times with Moscow, where you had to have um, Iran's foreign minister travel last minute um, to Moscow to to put, uh, you know, some pressure on on um, the country after the comments by Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, that slightly uh, rattled uh, positions here in Europe about what Moscow really wanted out of the JCPOA. Um, Also, from what I had heard, uh, China also got involved at that point um, to lean in on Moscow to step back from its comments that uh, JCPOA sanctions relief to Tehran had to also include a package uh, for for Russia so that the Russia-Iran trade wouldn't be hindered. And, And, you know, China's involvement was partially the reason why um, Moscow backtracked on that. It does seem, um, from at least my discussions with uh, policymakers that were engaged in the August round of talks, uh, that Russia uh, didn't hinder the talks, um, and that in itself was a constructive move, um, given where things are at with with Russia over Ukraine at the moment. Um, and I don't think there is great, uh, you know, um, expectation that Russia is going to go out on a limb and you know really force Iran into anything because. You know, there's a big question mark about what Russia would get out of a deal. Um, I would say um, compared uh, to, let's say, 2011, 2012, when we managed to get Russia on board with UN Security Council measures against Iran, we're in a very different setting these days in terms of, firstly, um, you know, Western relations with Russia and what Russia thinks it can get from cooperation with the West. So, you know, we're at a you know real rock bottom at the moment in recent times. And secondly, also in terms of Russia's threat perceptions about Iran's nuclear program and overall Iran as a you know security threat is very, very different to European capitals and the US. So, you know, Russia is a security uh, partner with Iran, is on an ally, but they do partner on different realms. Um, and we've seen that intensify. And, you know, in a nuclear threshold state in Iran um, is not the same threat to, to Russia, I would say, that as it is for European capitals and, and Washington and Israel. Um, so Russia, I think, has a much more comfortable maneuvering space when it comes to Iran's nuclear advancement um, than, than we do in Europe. But at the same time, I think the fact that it has leaned in, for example, on issues like the IAEA safeguards probe and also the overall uh, let's say, um, sanctity of a nuclear arms treaty with Iran or nuclear arms control agreement with Iran um, shows that they are interested in being a participant to this deal um, and at least for now not acting as a as a main hindrance. But, I, you know, I think that that switch can uh, really be turned on and off depending on the state of play more broadly with the geopolitics around Russia going forward. Thanks, Ali. And I, I, I'm paraphrasing one of the, the U.S. officials. I think we included this quote in the report, but we may have ended up on the cutting room floor as some of the juicier ones did. But I think that the description was uh, Russia went from unhelpful in the from helpful in the winter to unhelpful in the spring to not unhelpful in the summer or, or paraphrasing. But it was something along those lines, which I think aligns with uh, with what you're saying. Um, Ali, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, I agree with everything Ali said on this. I, I don't have anything to add. Wonderful. Um, Again, you are welcome to send us uh, more questions on uh, DMs. Uh, Ali, there's a a couple of questions about um, the the scope of, uh, you know, the potential escalations by by the U.S. on on the sanctions front. Um, One of the questions is, uh, you know, has essentially the Biden administration done as much as it could have on enforcing the sanctions uh, earlier on? And the flip side of that being given um, the, the oil market dynamics after the, the start of the war in, in Ukraine um, and the appetite uh, for, for energy from alternative sources. Um, how is this uh, market dynamic factoring in and, and how much leverage does, does the U.S. really have 
to go after uh, Iran's energy exports at, at this time, given everything that's happening? Good question. Uh, look, there are two uh, phenomena uh, that I think we should take a look at. Uh, one is uh, the fact that usually uh, after the initial imposition of sanctions, uh, after the initial shock, uh, the economy is adjust and uh, Iran uh, particularly is pretty good at uh, trying to circumvent uh, Western sanctions. Uh, and so after the initial shock of uh, the Trump administration in April of 2021, uh, trying to push Iran's oil exports to zero and being pretty successful uh, in, in driving Iranian oil exports down, uh, Iranian oil exports recovered. So before the Trump administration left office, uh, Iran's oil exports to China were um, hovering around a million barrels a day, uh, slightly less than that. Uh, but uh, when the Biden administration came in, of course, the expectation from them was not to double down on enforcement of sanctions, but for uh, an administration that most of its senior officials were critics of maximum pressure, had characterized it as uh, abject failure. Uh, to actually offer Iran goodwill gestures of sanctions relief, uh, maybe uh, because Iran at the time was dealing with another wave of uh, COVID pandemic, uh, even uh, providing them with uh, uh, assets, uh, uh, re releasing some of their frozen assets so that they would be able to purchase uh, vaccines. Um, it didn't do uh, any of those steps, uh, unfortunately, which I think uh, was a strategic mistake uh, in retrospect and deepened uh, mistrust and especially pushed the Iranian leadership to believe that uh, the Biden administration is basically uh, following uh, Trump's policy with a slightly softer tone. Uh, but, uh, you know, the minimum that they could do, which is what they did, was not to double down on enforcement uh, of uh, some of the sanctions. And so uh, they basically continued the pattern that we had seen in the final few months of the Trump administration. Uh, but, you know, by, by late uh, 2021, early 2022, Already, the, the fissure in uh, uh, U.S.-China relations uh, had widened and deepened to the extent that I think even if the Biden administration wanted to double down on enforcement uh, of sanctions, uh, it would not probably move uh, the needle by much because China is much less risk averse uh, towards U.S. sanctions than was the case uh, a few years ago. Uh, the Biden administration has tried to put pressure on uh, the intermediaries uh, that Iran uses to send its uh, oil to China. Uh, but uh, uh, but it hasn't really been uh, that successful. And that's why I said, uh, you know, one of the side effects of maximum pressure uh, is that it has maxed the U.S. Uh, out of its leverage. Uh, there is not much more that the U.S. can do on its own. Now, of course, this administration is much better placed to marshal and from support. Uh, the Europeans uh, could potentially join in uh, the sanctions effort. Uh, and there is the prospect of the snapback of the U.N. sanctions. And that, for sure, is going to have both a psychological and an economic impact uh, on Iran. Uh, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it would make a deal uh, likelier or a better deal possible. Um, and that it would be cost-free. And Ali, I think that th these issues that you're alluding to also come back to what we were talking about at the start, right, in terms of what Iran is asking in terms of guarantees. The, the issue of guarantees is partly a political one, right, where uh, a second U.S. defection uh, would make uh, uh, the Iranian government essentially look like suckers a second time for having entered into uh, an agreement with, uh, with Washington. But it also comes to this point about the uh, the economic side of guarantees and and like you like you mentioned I, I think we wrote about this in the January report as well that according to the World Bank and IMF figures Iran's uh, economy had clawed out of the red and into the black towards the second half of 2020 there are a lot of factors that go into this some of it is uh, oil some of it is starting from a much lower base after two years of contraction some of it has to do with um, increasing uh, regional trade some of it has to do um, with uh, changing some of the financial basis for its own domestic economy, increasing taxation and so on. So in, 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 the, in the discussion on guarantees, one of the things that you hear, aside from you know, the, the, the political risk of being uh, getting into a deal absconded uh, a second time, is that uh, on the economic side, A, um, some in, in Tehran believe that the, the resistance economy model uh, now works. Iran's economy may not be able to thrive, but it's surviving. Um, and the second one, it, which I personally would strongly contest, but it's that um, having now just a certain degree to, to, to sanctions, the shock of another withdrawal on the economy would outweigh the benefits of, of basically sputtering along uh, for the time being. Um, and again, notwithstanding the fact that uh, 
GDP figures don't tell you everything. Iran's GDP is, you know, still well, well short of President Raisi's 8% projections, but it is um, in the plus column. And and Ellie mentioned that the SCO meeting that's coming up, I'm sure that the Iranians, again, will show that this uh, shows the alternatives that they are to, to relying on Western companies and relying on oil exports. But when you look at inflation figures, uh, unemployment figures, um, the, the currency to a certain degree, the, the problems are, are uh, still very much um, there. So we're going to try to wrap up at the top of the hour. Um, but uh, And I know Ellie's got a couple of uh, remarks she wants to share on our recommendations. I feel as though perhaps I'm the most uh, pessimistic of the three of us, and Ellie is possibly a bit more optimistic than I am, and, and I, I hope I can get there as well. Um, but uh, Ellie, do you see uh, a, a snapback being discussed or do you see either a snapback being discussed or an SC referral that hypothesized at a, at a potential uh, at the next BOG meeting or through through an exceptional meeting of the BOG if this stalemate continues? I mean, will there be uh, or, or rather what will it take for Western maximum pressure as opposed to U.S. maximum pressure if it comes to it? Thanks, Nisan. So I don't think, um, at least in the European circles, we're at the stage where we're, we are you know, seriously discussing snapback. Um, and you know, as things stand, the US is not a party to the JCPOA. So the only countries that are most likely to resort to a snapback are the E3. And as your report highlighted, out of those, it's likely to either be the UK or France as permanent members of the Security Council that take that um, lead role. Um, you know, and I've been facing a lot of questions since the, the premiership here in the UK changed over whether the UK is going to become much more hawkish on Iran. My sense is that all these countries are facing such monumental domestic uh, priority issues uh, with the cost of living crisis, uh, with the war in Ukraine in terms of major foreign policy issues, that they are not going to um, really go against um, the US position or the joint E3 positioning, any of them. So I do think that the E3 will stay united, um, very likely with the US, on which uh, pathway they take. Um, I think the thing that is likely to trigger that step towards snapback would be a, you know, a major Iranian escalation on specifically the nuclear issue rather than um, other files. Obviously, the, the broader optics around Iran, the, the, the worse they get and the more deteriorating the, the relationship gets between these respective three countries and Iran, the more likely they are to, to resort to snapback. Um, but I do think it will be based on a what they view, what they will view as a legal justified uh, step under the JCPOA to res- revert to snapback. And that could include something along the lines of Iran significantly limiting the IAEA um, monitoring on the ground in Iran or Iran ratcheting up to 90% enrichment. I think those types of moves could really push uh, the, the E3. And of course, you know, as your report also highlights, there's a lot of scope for non-JCPOA parties to provoke that kind of escalation from Iran, namely, most likely, uh, the moves from Israel. Um, so far in the last few weeks, at least, it seems that things are more calm, and maybe this is a, a product of the U.S. leading more heavily on, on Israel. Maybe it's the product of things being in flux because of elections in Israel. We don't know, and we don't know where that position will go <coughs> in the near future. Um, I agree with Ali's comments that if we are still in this statement and in this sense of deep frustration with Tehran come December Board of Governors meeting, we are likely to see a much more um, punitive uh, push from the E3 side at the Board of Governors um, in conjunction, you know, to bring the US on board with that. Um, I, I don't foresee anything happening in advance of the UN General Assembly. I think the Europeans right now are focused on seeing what space there is, if any, to try and get um, a band-aid on the situation, to try and see if uh, the text uh, produced in August can be salvaged. And I think at the UN General Assembly, they might get a better sense of where things are going. And this takes me um, to some points I had briefly on on your excellent recommendations in the report, which I, I, uh, I'm very much in line with. I would say where my more optimistic nature comes in um, is that I think that for, for these single measure steps to work, they need to be part of a roadmap that's presented to Iran about how it goes into a more comprehensive arrangement with the US and the Europeans. Um, my uh, understanding also from the Iranian side is that they don't want to get stuck in what they view as uh, you know, a, a Western game of getting single um, extractions of concessions, which leads Iran at the end of it to be 
um, you know, disarmed of, of its nuclear capabilities in return for a, you know, short lived um, uh, and, uh, you know, not very tangible economic relief uh, from the Western Front. So I think that these short single measures that you have uh, outlined in the report, some of the ideas um, need to be agreed as part of a short time frame um, that um, put that band-aid on the situation. Um, so the parties agree not to agree on a, on a JCPOA structure deal, but they don't escalate. But that's, that's for a short period of time. And I think these single measures need to then lead up uh, as agreed from the start, to some sort of an interim deal. We don't need to call it that because there may be sensitivities, but some sort of a package like that, uh, which take us to the US elections. Um, and I think it's going to be very important not to leave this issue in a limbo phase at that point um, when we have a potentially um, new administration in the White House, whether it's Democrat or, or Republican, uh, but that there is at least a, a degree of um, containment of this issue um, and a sort of roadmap presented to Iran for, for where it could go uh, post um, the November elections. It may be something very similar to the JCPOA, if that's even possible by 2024, I'm not sure. Uh, and it may be more along the lines of a, of a more and more deal that um, there may be greater political space to reach once we have clarity on, on whether the Democrats are going to hold um, office or not. Uh, but I do think that we should tie these single measures to um, a more optimistic end result and also uh, give Iran a greater deal of a greater measure of confidence that it's not just aimed at extracting and disarming Iran um, without much commitment on the other side. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks very much, Ali. And Ali, I'm going to throw it to you as, as the, the resident, actual trained nuclear physicist. Um, given that BOG is happening and, and given that we have now seen the, the latest numbers uh, from the agency, where on the one hand, you have a nuclear program that is continuing to grow in size, and on the other hand, operating under considerable <clears throat> opacity, right? We, we've seen Grossi <clears throat> excuse me, uh, talk about you know, how difficult it would be, even if a deal is restored now in the safeguards report, to come back and establish um, continuity of knowledge. I mean, Iran uh, has been limiting access uh, since essentially uh, April 21, further cutting off cameras after the BOG resolution um, in June. So uh, taken all of that, taken where the size of Iran's uh, nuclear program is, and given the limits that, and, and constraints that there have been on monitoring and access, and, and we'll, we'll close up with this, you know, cheery Monday morning thought. But given all of this, uh, on a scale of uh, somewhat moderately concerned to quite quietly alarmed, uh, where are we in Iran's nuclear program today? And that's a good question and depends on who you're asking. Because, uh, you know, it was exactly 10 years ago at the UN General Assembly that uh, Bibi Netanyahu held up a, a cartoon bomb uh, and drew a red line on it, which was the amount of 20% enriched uranium uh, that if Iran would have would be a significant quantity that could be used uh, if further refined uh, to weapons grade in a nuclear weapon. Uh, Iran is now way beyond uh, that red line. And uh, it seems that uh, it is Israel's uh, threshold of concern that has moved. Uh, and it has moved from capability to weaponization, which is uh, problematic because capability is something that uh, you can monitor uh, through IAEA and have exact uh, numbers and, and you can calculate uh, rough estimates of a, of a potential breakout time. Uh, but there is no way uh, you can do so with weaponization uh, that would probably happen in clandestine facilities. Uh, look, Iran's breakout time now, uh, according to my calculations, is four days. Um, uh, and, you know, given the amount of 60 percent enriched uranium that Iran has, which I think by the end of the year probably would be sufficient for two weapons. Uh, Iran has also uh, about uh, two weapons worth of uh, 20 percent enriched uranium and another two at five percent. So it's like it's an arsenal. Uh, and with uh, IR6 centrifuges uh, and, and uh, especially because IEA has not been able to monitor the production of centrifuges, there might be now hundreds of advanced centrifuges that have been produced. Uh, that we're unaware of. Uh, and so all of that, if the concern is really uh, a proliferation concern, uh, should be uh, at a very high level. Um, but uh, again, uh, we, we're living in a different world and the priorities have changed. Uh, and, and I don't think necessarily that unless Iran uh, 
ventures into the weaponization uh, related uh, category of activities uh, that uh, that if its nuclear program continues at pace, uh, it would uh, ring the alarm bells uh, on, on this side of the pond. Um, I, I just want to say I, I agree with uh, what uh, Ellie said uh, about the single measures eventually uh, being uh, uh, part of a roadmap that would lead both sides to a more durable uh, kind of arrangement. One hundred percent. I think that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, but you know, the the reason we we've been humble uh, in in our recommendation of a of a single measure. Uh, is because of uh, uh, the record of the past uh, year and a half uh, that has proven uh, that both sides have real difficulty in uh, uh, coming to the same page uh, and and trusting one another. Um, uh, we hope abs- absolutely that we're wrong, uh, that that there is uh, more flexibility and more political will on both sides. Uh, but uh, but that's that's the reason uh, we uh, went for a very very narrow option. Um, I also see, Nason, that uh, Borzu uh, is on the call, um, uh, and I want to just give the platform to him for a second, uh, if he has a comment or a question, and then maybe we can wrap it up right after that. Uh, Hi, Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, just a quick question, um, but I think kind of an important one. uh, And and I think, Ali, you you just sort of kind of addressed some of it. but I, I, I just, you know, I'm a little bit confused about the internal logic of uh, Iran's prem at this point. At, at, at what point do they stop? And what is the aim of, uh, you know, kind of amassing uh, this much? They proved a point. Um, if they're not going for uh, a nuclear weapons arsenal, um, you would think they would slow down and send a message of moderation. And if they are, um, why do it at this point in this way? Why wouldn't you kind of create an underground, undeclared program? Um, at, at this point, you know, every, the world knows Iran's capabilities. It knows what it's, uh, that, that it, as you said, you know, four days is the breakout time. Um, you know, if, they, if the point is to prove and, and set up the fact of Iran's potential nuclear capabilities, that prove point has been reached. So what's the point of putting the uh, pedal to the metal and risking uh, renewed international sanctions at the Security Council level? Thanks. Good question, uh, Borzu. I'll uh, tell you what I think, and then I would love to also hear Elie's thoughts uh, before we wrap up. Uh, look, uh, the reality is, uh, for the longest time, Iran's nuclear advancements were made uh, precisely because Iran was trying to strengthen its hand and uh, have more leverage at the negotiating table in order to be able to extract a better deal. In fact, Ali Bagheri himself, when he was uh, out of power, uh, conducted a series of interviews about his time uh, as a deputy negotiator under Jalili. Uh, and he explains the exact same logic that he says, you know, from one round of negotiations to another, from Almaty 1 to Almaty 2, from Istanbul 1 to Istanbul 2, we made these nuclear advancements. And then the U.S., which was unwilling to make concessions on X and Y, agreed eventually uh, to uh, to take a step back uh, uh, and, and basically offer those concessions to Iran. Uh, but now that Iran is so close to the verge of nuclear weapons, I think uh, the, the allure of crossing the Rubicon uh, and maybe taking that last step has become a subject that is uh, more and more discussed uh, among the leadership. Um, and uh, you even hear it uh, uh, being mentioned more publicly than was the case in the past. Um, but, you know, the reality is uh, I don't think Iran would be able to cross that threshold uh, without uh, being uh, attacked uh, by the U.S. and or Israel, uh, because this is also a program that is so deeply penetrated by Western and Israeli intelligence uh, that, uh, uh, you know, evidenced by the fact that it has been target uh, of covert operations uh, for so many years. Um, and uh, and so you know, the current conclusion and, and among uh, U.S. Uh, intelligence community, uh, as well as Europeans, uh, to my knowledge, is that uh, Iran has not made the decision uh, to move towards nuclear weapons. Um, I think if that conclusion changes, uh, then uh, the calculation uh, would also change. And we've heard uh, that President Biden has also uh, asked his national security team uh, to revise uh, and a new uh, all the contingency plans that the U.S. would have. Uh, I just simply cannot believe a scenario in which uh, this U.S. president, especially any U.S. president, but especially this one, uh, would want to be the one under which Iran uh, 
uh, would become a nuclear weapon state. Uh, now, living with a virtual nuclear weapon state is a different proposition, but, uh, but for Iran to actually develop nuclear weapons, I think it will probably be stopped before it. Um, that doesn't mean that it would not eventually get to that stage. Countries that are keen and determined uh, to develop nuclear weapons eventually will, uh, and Iran has the know-how and the ability to do so. I'm just saying that it would not come uh, cost-free, and it would also come at a strategic cost for Iran, which I think that has been the biggest reason, uh, not for religious reasons, but for strategic reasons, that they've not uh, taken that last step, uh, is because then it would start an arms race uh, in the region uh, that Iran is almost bound to lose because it would not be able to compete uh, with the financial resources uh, that a lot of it, that a lot of its neighbors have and access that they have uh, in order to enter into a nuclear game of this uh, that is determined not by your size or the size of your population uh, 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 and uh, you know by the depth of your statehood, uh, but uh, by the number of nuclear weapons, the sophistication that they have, and whether you have second strike capabilities or not. So it would be an entirely different game. And I think that has been the main reason Iran has not crossed that Rubicon. Uh, but, you know, it, things might change. Again, if Iran is attacked, uh, that would be definitely uh, uh, a change in uh, Iran's, uh, it would trigger a change in Iran's nuclear doctrine. If there's a major change in leadership, if Ayatollah Khamenei is not there anymore, who knows if Iran would uh, continue to adhere uh, to its current doctrine. Um, I hope that answers your question. But again, I'm curious to hear what uh, Eli thinks. Thanks. I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um agree with Ali on all those points. I just had a couple. Um, one is that I think that Iran uh, genuinely expected more from a democratic White House. Um, and th what we're seeing play out here is a sort of backlash from Tehran for that huge disappointment <laughs> about the fact that President Biden didn't move in the first 100 days to quickly go back into a clean compliance for compliance. Um, and, and they have now gone so far with this idea of uh, reciprocity, uh, with continued U.S. maximum pressure and continued um, new layers of U.S. sanctions that have appeared under the Biden administration, that they have no choice but to keep um, adding to these. Um, small footnote, uh, probably an Iranian official would also say we're mandated by the December 2020 legislation to continue with these nuclear advancements um, until we have full economic relief from, from the other side. Um, I think another point is that uh, some inside Iran would argue that they have to continue um, building this leverage, even if they are in some cases crossing the Rubicon, particularly on knowledge and development. Um, they have to continue going as they as they see it to prepare for a potential Trump 2.0 uh, administration. If they hit a wall with the Biden uh, team on getting back to a deal, um, they want to continue stocking up um, what they see as their chips and cards to play with a much more, um, let's say, aggressive, irrational um, White House under a Republican administration that will only understand, you know, the, the, the use of uh, major force by Iran in terms of its nuclear advancement. And finally, I would say, you know, it goes back to a point I made at the beginning that I do think the Ukraine conflict and the way that the, that the different chips have been placed around the globe have made a lot of people stop and think in Tehran about their options. Um, not only that in terms of the East and the West, but we've seen very interesting advancement in Iran's relations with Eurasian states, with um, Arab Gulf nations. So I think that has fueled this thinking in Tehran that actually we don't need the West as much as we used to think we do. And we have options, um, even though that means we won't meet our full economic potential as things stand. But in the long run, perhaps if we are recognized as a kind of nuclear threshold state, and perhaps even more uh, under a new supreme leader in Iran that will make a more bold decision, as some would want to go the whole way on, on the nuclear front, um, then they will in the wrong, long run better provide security for um, the Islamic Republic of Iran as they view it. Um, so, you know, I, I think that those forces have, you know, their position has been much more strengthened uh, by the conflict in Ukraine to continue down this path. Thanks, Lisa. Over. Thanks so much, Ali, and, and thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, and, and Ali as well, um, plenty uh, to get us started on a, on a dark Monday here in DC and lots more to follow in Vienna as Bog rolls ahead this week. Um, President Raisi will be in Samarkand for the for the SCO meeting, and then uh, it's not long before everyone convenes in in Turtle Bay for the diplomatic Super Bowl that is uh, UNGA. So um, thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks for your questions. Uh, feel free to check out the report, which is at crisisgroup.org, and pithily summed up in a thread that Ali posted.
uh, this morning. And um, if we haven't filled you with optimism, hopefully we've at least given you some better questions to think about. So thanks very much and take care.